CE5. Human initiated contact. So, how is this done? Given Schrodinger's idea that the number of all minds in the universe is one, in order to make this type of contact, a human could potentially access that single inner consciousness through intense meditation and then visualize his location down through the Milky Way, to the planet Earth, to wherever he sits under the stars. In theory, then, any extraterrestrial passing by would be able to hear the broadcast and know exactly where to go, if they choose to do so. It's interesting how many people have never been uh, out in a place like this where they can see the whole Milky Way galaxy. Most people who come for a week, it, it alters their life. There's meditation techniques, there's remote viewing techniques, and once you start learning these processes and refining them, then you can make contact more quickly, more easily, and be more of an asset to the group. Checking to be sure that there's no source from anyone else so that when we do start having electromagnetic signals through this, we know that it's a legitimate source. My name's Emery Smith. I've uh, been with CSETI for approximately three years. Getting the baseline reading from us. My duties consist of a couple things. I am uh, Dr. Greer's head security detail. Uh, I also am their photographer. I operate anywhere from two to six cameras at one time. Yeah, that's our craft. It was over the mountains in this direction. Many of the craft that are coming in are transdimensional and the way I understand it not visible to the human eye and that's where this new technology the uh, night vision that's where that's coming into play and with the advent of new technology that's out there it becomes easier and easier for us to capture these beings and these celestial objects on film after you do the night vision it has that green hue of course and after a while when you get back to real life you're thinking, why isn't everything green? This can't be reality. I want to show an early one from Gulf Breeze from 1992. We went down there. And one of the fun things that happened is that I had about 40, 50 people. Let's go out on the beach. And we didn't have good cameras then. But you'll get the feeling of how exciting it was. Have all these people. And one, and then two, and then three, and then four ET craft materialized right in the sky. There it goes. One, two, three. Yeah. And look, there's four. There's four. There's four. We have a confirmed CE5. Holy damn hot shit. <laughs> hot dog. Thank you. All right. So the point, <laughs> the point is, <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> It's your responsibility to uh, go into meditation, find a little bit of time, 10, 15 minutes, and remote view who's up there and how many. I can attest to the fact that real phenomenon happens here. I really feel that his CE5 protocols are based on a, a spiritual kind of positive contact and I think that uh, that is an excellent model for any kind of communication, whether it be on Earth, uh, in the United Nations or wherever, but in this particular field it's with cosmic cultures. And we use consciousness, uh, meditation, visualization, remote viewing, certain tones, and we do it in a group when we can, or even as individuals. It's just, it's just been this series of unbelievable events that are amplified by, by our meditation. It uh, enforces this communication between us and the ETs, and it's, it's so interactive. Um, I can feel everything, I can hear all the sounds just right there. Perfect. And then this being the, the little larva one comes up and, and I kind of, we had this hug and I shared the joy and I'm like just thanking it for this experience. 
Let's do let's do what we can to feel as if it would feel that this is perfectly normal and natural. Oh sure. And that you know this is relax and get in that flow consciousness exactly so i was jarred by our group getting like tripped out and in that kind of like it, i was startled by some of the ways that our group were, was being and i was going and then there was moments where i was like wow i can only imagine how oh, yeah. a visitor might feel the ets pick up on your intentions and if you're really out there just to learn and really want to communicate with these extraterrestrials well it's going to happen Avahanam Narayanam Padma Bhavam Vashishtam Shaktim Chatat Putra Parasharam Cha Yasam Shukam Golda Param Mahantam Govinda Yogindra Matashashisham And we ask these extraterrestrial civilizations to join us as they begin to learn of us, to help us, and to understand us, even as we endeavor to understand them and welcome them here to this beautiful planet. Namaste. Oh my God, another beautiful, stunning, absolutely stunning. There's a very fast military. Okay, they're gonna go. Oh. It turned right to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It literally, my heart literally sunk when, when the when the jet when the, when the jet you know got to where where the craft had to had to phase out. Yeah. I like to to feel all that love build. And then to feel that jet coming in, and it was like you, on, on a heart level, you, I, my heart literally sunk when, yeah. the, when the jet crossed the path where it had to take off. It's not like a satellite where it's like got like a path. It's got like a, you know, like a movement. Yeah, and then it's gone. When I was 17, um, I uh, injured myself. I got so infected. And at the time, because I was very poor and I didn't have any health care, I just laid there and I got sicker and sicker and sicker and I had a near-death experience. I found myself out in deep space. And it was this experience of complete oneness with the cosmos, not just with Earth and life on Earth, but with the stars and the infinity of creation. Uh, it, it certainly altered the course of what I would end up doing because I then learned meditation. I actually became very aware of the power of the mind. This experience helped guide the direction of his life. Though Greer went on to earn a medical degree and raise a family, continued to study consciousness and contact. And decades later, it seems he would be the doctor called upon first to examine a very unusual body. This came to us in the last couple of years, and there's a man who runs an institute in another country that I cannot talk about. But he came into possession of a little creature. It is humanoid. It does not look human. We have acquired an EBE, an extraterrestrial biological entity. We're flying over to Europe soon to uh, take some tissue samples and do some uh, DNA testing. This was found in the Atacama Desert. We don't know how it came about. Here's the great view of the face and cheekbone, very complex. Now there is a fracture here and behind this right ear, 
is caved in, and that's how, how this, this, this ET beam was killed. We have the best scientists in the U.S. from Stanford that are going to be doing the testing itself to see what this really is and also to rule out what it's not. The uh, initial reaction that I had is the same reaction that many of my colleagues here at Stanford and elsewhere have had when I've shown them, is that, wow, what is this? The question is important enough in at least two ways. Uh, the primary reason is that there's a lot of claims about specimens and claims about uh, uh, aliens. And of course, there's a lot of ridicule associated with that. So. One of the best things that we should be doing, of course, then is bringing the best scientific techniques to bear. The techniques are available, the techniques are cheap, the answers are nearly absolute, so let's do it. And it's so exciting because it's not just... In setting up for this, uh, I'm gonna be giving Steve uh, not only the tubes that this should be going into, but I'm also going to be sending across the microscope that I feel they should be using to do the analysis with. Before we even get started with some of the analysis, I think it's going to be important to rule out some of the obvious critiques that could come up. And one of those critiques is that this is a syndrome or a mutation. This is a bone dysplasia. And luckily, uh, here at Stanford, we happen to have literally the world's expert, the man who wrote the book on bone dysplasias and syndromes, a gentleman by the name of uh, Dr. Ralph Lachman, who uh, has kindly agreed to look at the specimen, uh, both the pictures as well as the CT scans and the x-rays, uh, to help determine whether or not it's anything that he's ever seen before. I think that a dozen or even 15 years ago, answering the question of what is this would really not have been possible because the kinds of technologies were not available as are available today. But really the DNA tells the story. And because we have the computational techniques, that allows us to determine in very short order whether in fact uh, this is human. So this will be basically uh, an absolute level of proof as to what this actually is. The problem is not proving that UFOs exist. It's when you begin to expose the energy and propulsion systems behind how they're getting here. You're talking about unveiling an entirely new science that would replace oil, gas, coal, nuclear power, public utilities. And this is the $600 trillion problem. So the patent office, after they fired me, I had to wait six years before I got rehired. Everybody at the office was avoiding the case. But when they finally did, the arbitrator wrote an 85-page 80, um, report on how the media had caused my dismissal. So I only got a 30-day suspension out of the whole thing, <laughs> which what? was taken out of the what? tiny little plan? bit of six-year back pay. So that was great. Oh, yeah, it, was, yeah, it made it all wonderful. worth it, so to speak, because that's how we were able to open the offices and stuff. It was very comfortable. Uh, no feeling of being shocked or anything else, just a, you know, a good feeling, comfortable. What scientists need to do and normal people need to do is they need to look at the hardcore evidence, decide that, oh my gosh, ETs are real, and then get over that. And if that's the case, then you can start extrapolating yeah. because they're getting here, which means they have solved the physics problem, if you will. That's an actual photograph that uh, Mark Whitford took, a friend of mine. And you see the stars in the background. Mm -hmm. So this is a fixed camera. Mm -hmm. The craft was a triangular craft moving away from him. And all of a sudden, it makes a right angle turn. Apparently, it has what I would describe as inertial shielding. It's the only way something can make a right angle turn without having everybody killed inside of the craft. Though we experience inertial forces every day, their origins remain a mystery. However, there are theories that point to interactions between objects with mass and a quantum energy field. Inertia is due to the zero-point energy interaction. So you're interacting with a charged matrix, which is a zero-point field. If you try to change that, 
then you get a reaction force. There must be an interference shield of electromagnetic nature that would stop that interaction with the zero-point field.